Assalamualaikum. Uh, first of all, uh, my sincerest apologies that you had to wait. That you had to uh, wait for almost uh, like we have we rescheduled it, and I'm really sorry about that. And I really really appreciate that you guys uh, joined back on uh, at uh, at the new time. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Miss Fatima. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Musa. How are you? It's good to see you guys here. All right. So basically. What I want to do today, what our goal today is, that we want to make sure that we understand everything there is to know about organic chemistry. Now, uh, we would need a good two hours, but I would like this session to be not just about the concept, but also about applying that. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Applying whatever we have to study, because concept is one thing. There are some facts, there are some concepts, there are some... A phenomena that we need to know about but more importantly we need to know how to apply them and this is equally true for IGCSC equally true for A levels oh uh, sorry O levels so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share two worksheets with you and I would suggest that uh, you start by taking those worksheets whichever your syllabus is and uh, then we will take things forward from there so here you go I'm just sharing the link with you just give me a minute Yeah, so if you are somebody who takes IGCSE, then here is your link. So make sure that you open this file on the side. So this is the link for IGCSE and uh, this is the link for O-Levels. It's syncing, just give me a minute. Okay, I'll share the link once it's ready. So here's the thing. What are some facts that we need to know about organic? So we'll start with the definitions. There are five uh, homologous series. So what is homologous series? That's the first definition that we have. Homologous series is basically just like in the rest of chemistry you have groups in periodic table, right? So you know halogens. Halogens all behave in similar fashion. They have trends in their physical properties. They have similar chemical properties and uh, Aslam Abdullah and uh, those properties are going to be similar for all the halogens. So they are a group, they are a group of elements that act in a similar fashion. Just like that, we have homologous series. Homologous series is group of compounds that behave in a similar fashion, okay? So that is the difference in, uh, that's what homologous series are. Now here's the thing, they're related to each other. Just like in halogens, every atom or every element is related to the other by the idea that if you have fluorine, it has one shell, less than chlorine that has one shell less than bromine one shell less than iodine but all of them have seven electrons in the last shell so there is a similarity and there's some change just like that in homologous series there are similarities what are the similarities they are the similarities in physical properties and chemical properties so they have similar chemical properties and they have trends in physical properties. So just like in halogens, you have gases at the top, then become solid, uh, liquid, then become solid, just like that, then you have similar physical property differences in these homologous series. So if you are starting with very first homologous series member, let's like suppose methanol, then methanol would have lesser boiling point than ethanol. It will have lesser boiling point than propanol, and that's how it goes, okay? So there's going to be some trend in physical properties that they have. And uh, just like I told you that there's going to be fixed change in halogens. Every halogen is one shell less than the next one. Just like that, every homologous series thing is one carbon, two hydrogen less than the next one. So methanol will be one carbon, two hydrogen less than ethanol. Ethanol will be one carbon, two hydrogen less than propanol. So they are going to be, there's a difference of CH2 in successive members. These are the three important ideas that you need to know. And of course, they have same general formula. Okay, so what homolog series do we have? We have alkanes, so that's the first one. Alkenes, 
to some extent alkynes but we don't study them in detail in o levels or igcse we have alcohols we have carboxylic acids so these are the ones that are common to both o levels and igcse in igcse a couple of years back they added they, there was a question on aldehydes so they introduced a new homologous series and that's something that examiner does you are not supposed to know the properties of aldehydes or the general formula or anything but because you know that they have similar chemical properties they have trends and physical properties they have same general formula they have a difference in ch2 you should be able to apply this regardless of whether you are familiar with that homologous series or not because what's the key difference one carbon two hydrogen add them and you get the next one so for example if i said there is a new homologous series which is methylamine so let's suppose methylamine has it has ch3 NH2 as its formula. It's a completely new homologous series. You haven't seen it. And in the exam, they just gave you this one. So what will be the next one? Asalaamu Alaikum Rayan. Good to see you here. Now, what's the next one? You know that you just have to add one carbon, two more hydrogen. So one carbon, two more hydrogen. There you go. That is ethylamine. I want to make a new one. Okay. Add one carbon, two more hydrogen. One carbon, two more hydrogen. Propanamine. And that's it. That's the idea that the examiner is going to check on homologous series. It's, he's, he's definitely going to ask you about alkanes, their general formula, their different names and all that. But they can still introduce you to completely new homologous series. But as long as you stick and you understand these four principles, you won't have any trouble. So if you look in IGCSE papers, you will find the question on aldehydes. And aldehydes are something that you don't study in O-levels. Yet you are able to solve questions for that because, you know, if I know the first aldehyde, let's say my first aldehyde is this one. So that's my first aldehyde and this name has the name methanol. Okay, so that's the name. Now you haven't seen it in O-levels or IGCC. But if I ask you for the next one, you'll say, okay, as long as it's the same homologous series, I'll just add one more carbon, two more hydrogen. So I'll just uh, add one more carbon, two more hydrogen. And that gives me ethanol. Okay. I, I I want to know the third one, sure. Two more carbon now, and that is propanol. So that's how the name would change. So it's important to remember that same general formula applies and things change by CH2. Aslan Ali, good to see you here. Yeah, basically that's the thing. Thank you, Ryan, for summarizing this. Just add one more carbon and just fill the hydrogen up because hydrogen is the filler in organic chemistry. Okay, so that's homologous series. Now, what about the general formulas that you're supposed to actually remember? Uh, those are for alkanes, that is Cn, H2n plus 2. Now, examiner is smart. He can also ask you that, okay, what if I say that alkane is Cn, H2n with 2 hydrogen? Sure, no problem. That's possible, although they won't write it like that because of some ways in which this can be interpreted but alkenes for example are cnh2n and this thing can also be written as ch2n and sure there you go and based on this formula do you see that the empirical formula of many different alkenes would be ch2 that's it okay so judging by this you are able to know different members and different uh, general formulas what about alcohols? Cn, H2n plus 1. So all you're doing is you're removing from alkenes, you're removing one hydrogen, putting OH instead of that. And that's alcohol. So alkane was Cn, H2n plus 2. Alcohol is Cn2, H2n plus 1. That was plus 2. This is plus 1. You have basically replaced one hydrogen with OH. Okay. Carboxylic acid, similar. Absolutely similar. You take the alkane cnh2 and plus 2 but instead of plus 2 now you're going to have plus 1 that one hydrogen you're going to replace it with cwh yes very good very good ryan yeah so there you go those are the four general formulas you're supposed to remember uh now going beyond the syllabus a little bit this portion is called an alkyl and this is r usually written as r and uh, why do we write this? Because it allows us to simplify this. We can say that now everywhere you have CnH2n plus 1. What if I want to join this with another one? 
So there is two alkyls and O in the middle. This thing is called ether. Because of that O, it has basically created a new functional group. It is a new linkage that we have. So that is the linkage, ether linkage. I could take that R and put C double bond O and then another oxygen there. And this one is called ester linkage. And I could take the same thing and put this thing in the middle. And that would be called amide linkage or peptide if it is in the natural compounds. So judging by this, you can see that you don't need a general formula for ester because esters are all about having C double O in the middle. Whatever is on the right and left side could be anything because esters are not a typical homologous series. They are just identified by having C double O in the middle. Ryan, do you understand this now? Similarly, ethers, they just have oxygen in the middle and C O N H in the middle, amide or peptide linkage, whatever is on the sides, that's it. I, it could be anything. And why do I need to know this? Because these linkages occur so many times in our real lives. These linkages are part of condensation polymers that we studied right at the end of organic chemistry. But you should be able to make these connections here. So amide and peptide linkage, they are present in, amide is present in nylon, but this is not nylon. Peptide is present in protein. Again, this is not protein. Ester is present in fats or terylene. Again, two things that this is not right now. This is just an ester. And ether is present in, ether linkage is present in carbohydrates. Okay, so these are the five kinds of mo polymers and monomers that you're supposed to know. Now, here's the thing. Why aren't these polymers then, if they have the linkage? Why aren't these polymers? Because for something to be polymer, it should have linkage on both sides. It shouldn't stop by having R. It should continue. It should continue on both sides. It should be a long chain molecule. Which means you get the thing, then the linkage, then another thing, linkage, another thing, linkage. That's the general structure of a polymer. So that means for any polymer, all I need is basically instead of R, which is the building block of these closed molecules like esters or other things. For polymers, I just need a box to show whatever's in there. It could be anything. It could be literally any organic compound, any organic part. I don't care. Whatever it is, my focus would be on the linkage. Hello, Rafi. And then if I attach one box with another and another, and in the middle, I put the linkage. I just made polyamide. It could be polypeptide. Depends how I complete it, but it should have linkage on both sides. So about polymers, what you're supposed to know is that if they have linkage, then they are condensation polymers. So we have seen homologous series, we have seen different linkages, and now we're looking on to polymers. I'm just telling you the general structure and the principle that you have to remember for organic chemistry. Again, if you have a notebook or something that you're writing on, write this down somewhere. In the rest of the chemistry, it is the individual particles that matter. In inorganic chemistry, you talked about ions. In organic chemistry, it is the structure that matters. So in organic chemistry, structure is paramount. If something has different structure, it will have different properties. It will be completely new thing. Okay, and that brings me to another definition, isomer. So I'll come back to polymers in a bit. Isomer, what is that? They have same general formula, right? Same general, in fact, not just same general formula, they have the same molecular formula. But they have different structure. And if you know organic chemistry, which you know, and hopefully by the end of this lesson you will, if they have different structure, then they are different compound. That's it. In organic chemistry, structure matters. Structure is the most important thing, okay? Yeah. Uh, Rafe, condensation polymer could be saturated, could be unsaturated, doesn't matter. We don't know. Unl until we know what is in the box, we wouldn't be able to know whether it's saturated or not. Okay, so now we know homologous series, we know how to identify linkages. Now let's try to identify polymers. Again, polymers are made from the linkages or by just joining the monomers. 
So let's see, there is one kind of polymer in which I have the box here, okay? And I have O in the middle, another O in the middle, and it keeps on continuing, okay? It keeps on going. And this bracket is supposed to show that it is continuing, it's not stopping. That is different from this one because here the R was telling me that it has stopped, it is completed. But here, because the bracket is there, it tells me that the link is completely continuing. Now here's the thing, you just identify the linkage. If it has the ether linkage, it is what you just saw, carbohydrate. Ether linkage, carbohydrate. Okay, it could have another linkage. Now examine it can give you another linkage, like this linkage. You just have to identify the linkage, okay? And linkage, and it should continue. Those are the two things that make a polymer. Linkage, continuity. Okay, so I have this thing here. Uh, let's suppose, um, now this could be the other way around as well. It could be something like this, okay? And uh, yeah, if I do this, and I continue with, Sorry about that. Yeah. So yeah, this thing because it has ester linkage in there, it could be tetraline, it could be polyester. Again, the key is identifying the linkage. Okay. Then next thing, I could have this thing. So I look at it. I know this is amide linkage, but is it? polyamide or is it polypeptide? Is it a protein or is it a nylon? I don't know until I see the full thing. Okay, so how do you see the full thing? Look at the other side. If it has this thing, compare one linkage with the other. So on this side, I have C, N, N, C. Did you notice that it switched? C, N, N, C. If it is switching, then it is polyamide. So if it is switching, it is poly, sorry, polyamide, okay? So polyamide continues to go like that on this side and on this side, and I keep on continuing this, okay? That is a polyamide. But if it has a similar structure, this one also has this linkage. The linkage is there, structure is similar, but it does not switch. It goes CN, 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 CN. If it does that, then I know that this is made from something that is amino acid, that is protein if you look individually you know, on uh, this thing and that thing they're both the same like if i look individually on this linkage and this linkage they're entirely the same but it is the way that it fits into the larger molecule that determines whether it's polyamide or polypeptide if it is switching cn and c cn and c that's polyamide if it's not switching if it is CN, 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 it is polypeptide, okay? So it just continues like that, and yeah. But if I ask you, what is similar, sorry, this is polypeptide, what is similar in all of them, in all these four ones, this was carbohydrate, that was fat or terylene, in all of them, there is one thing that's common, and that is these brackets. The idea that this thing continues, and anything that continues to grow like that is a polymer, even if there's no linkage present, okay? Even if there is no linkage present, it would be a polymer, okay? And how do you identify that? It's really simple. What if I had something like this? Because it's continuing, it's a polymer. 
but because it doesn't have the linkage it is addition polymer okay so that's the primary difference in the two kinds of polymers that we have what makes anything a polymer long chains things that continue to go and what makes something uh, addition polymer absence of linkages okay yeah c double o is all acyl linkage all right so this one now try to understand where it is repeating this one for example is repeating for this block so that's my repeat unit and whenever you are asked to draw this draw two repeat units at least okay so i know how to identify the infrastructure so the first part of our lesson is complete now we wanted to know how to identify different structures so here's the thing let's go if the formula has all single bonds all single bonds and it has a uh, cnh2n plus 2 that is alkane if it has at least one carbon carbon double bond it is alkene if it has the OH group, this one, then it is alcohol. And if it has C double OH group, that carboxylic acid, then that's the homologous series. Then if it has this linkage, this linkage, or this linkage, that shows the different kinds of polymers that it could make. But it's not one homologous series. Okay. And then if it has these linkages and it continues, if it is continuing, it is polymer. And if it continues with the linkage, condensation, without a linkage, uh, addition polymers. All right. Uh, Hussein, what's the question? Ask away. Just give me a minute. I'll be back. I need to get a charger for my laptop. All right, so let's resume. Yes, Hussain, do you have a question? Or anybody else? If you have any question on how this works or how we identify them, tell me. Condensation polymers. Condensation polymers are again, first of all, how do you identify something as polymer? it has to have a continuity. It has to have that bracket around it. That shows it is continuing. And how do you know it's condensation? It has uh, what you call, it's a condensation polymer because it has a linkage. So there's only three linkages, the oxygen linkage or ether, the carboxylic, C double O, the ester linkage, and CONH, which is the amide or peptide linkage. So if it has one of those linkages, that shows that this is a Condensation polymer. If it is continuing without linkage, addition polymer. Okay. All right. I will come back to how to make polymers later on. Don't worry. So let's, if you don't have any questions, or if you do, just feel free to ask. But let's move on to the next part of our, our lesson today, which is organic reactions. Now, when it comes to organic reactions, there are many different reactions and almost all organic compounds do one or two of them or even more of them. So don't stick to the idea that substitution only happens in alkenes. It can happen in alkenes. In fact, that's how we make many, many different 
polymers okay so how do these reactions work and what we can do to understand them first of all all organic compounds do one reaction that is combustion and what's combustion it is when they react with oxygen to make different compounds like carbon dioxide water or other compounds as well so all organic compounds burn for example cars why do cars burn cars are supposed to be made of metals right but more than 40 percent of our cars are the material inside is organic the dashboard the steering wheel the uh, seats the cushion in them our mats all of that is organic which is why they can burn right the fuel is organic as well now combustion is something that is applied on all organic compounds they can all burn so let's take any hydrocarbon again a definition hydrocarbon is a compound made of hydrogen and carbon only so any hydrocarbon that you have let's say i have c2h4 that's ethene right it will burn whenever you burn stuff you need oxygen so is sun a ball of fire what do you think it's not yeah it's not because sun does not have oxygen you need oxygen for things to burn so sun does not have fire going on there it's not a ball of fire it is doing a nuclear reaction not a chemical reaction okay so how does this work i take carbon dioxide i take water and the only case in which this happens is if i have excess oxygen an examiner uses this in the mcqs for example examiner will say an unknown compound is burnt and uh, it produces this much carbon dioxide it produces this much water confirm which compound it was that was burnt so you can identify that by understanding how the combustion works so if you look at combustion equation you will see that the only source of carbon on the left side is the fuel and only thing with carbon on the right side is carbon dioxide which means jitne aapke paas carbon in the compound honge utne hi carbon dioxide banenge yes hydrogen is flammable in fact it's explosive so that means if i have two carbon on the left i will make two carbon dioxide that's the ratio i'm going to get equal number of carbon dioxide molecules as the number of carbon atoms in there okay what about hydrogen water has h2o right so water has two hydrogen atoms so whatever hydrogen i have on the left will be halved so if i have four hydrogen on the left i'll get two water if i had six hydrogen on the left i'll get three water okay so that's pretty straightforward now what about oxygen you can balance it it's in excess doesn't matter how much you need so i right now i have four oxygen required for carbon dioxide and two for water so that is six so i'll balance it by three over there okay now let's suppose we have an mcq the question says that uh, an unknown hydrocarbon is burnt okay an unknown hydrocarbon is burnt i know it's an hydrocarbon which means it just has carbon or hydrogen and it's unknown so i just put x and y there because i don't know how many carbon how many hydrogen it has and i'm reacting it with oxygen and the examiner says it uses exactly so 10 cm cube of unknown hydrocarbon uses 50 cm cube of oxygen to produce uh, 40 cm cube carbon dioxide okay it is hydrocarbon let me write the equation carbon dioxide plus water what about the numbers it's straightforward i will use something called avogadro's law avogadro's law is pretty straightforward it says that for gases mole ratio is same as volume ratio which means that the ratio of gas volume that i have is same as ratio of moles that I have so what is the gas volume i have do i have 10 cm cube of hydrocarbon as a gas yeah do i have 50 cm cube of oxygen as a gas yeah do i have 40 cm cube of carbon dioxide as a gas yeah 
which means the ratio of these gases, the moles, is exactly going to be the ratio of volume. So what's the ratio of volume? It is 1 for hydrocarbon, 5 for oxygen, and 4 for carbon dioxide. That's it, right? So let me just figure out how much uh, of the hydrocarbon I have. Let's see. So I have 4 carbon dioxide. Okay. That will use 8 of the oxygen. And how much oxygen do I have on the left? So I have 10 in total. 5 times 2 is 10. So all right. So I have 10 on the left side for oxygen. And 8 is in carbon dioxide. So what's left? Just 2. And where would those two be? In water. Do you see this? What's happening here? I am balancing oxygen. I do not know what hydrocarbon I have. I'm just balancing oxygen. And now I know what hydrocarbon I have. How come? Because equations are balanced. So how many carbon do I have on the right side? 4. 4 CO2 is 4 C. So I have C4. How many hydrogen on the right side? 2 times 2, that is 4 again. So I have 4 hydrogen. So my hydrocarbon is C4H4. That's a difficult MCQ, by the way. So I'm using two ideas. Number one, I'm using the idea of Avogadro's law that for gases, mole ratio is same as volume ratio. So I just took the volume that they gave me and found the mole ratio from that. Number two. I'm balancing equation and because I know law of conservation of matter, I know if I have carbon on the right side, it comes from the hydrocarbon on the left side. If I have hydrogen on the right side, it comes from hydrocarbon on the left side. And that is how I'm able to balance and do my question. Okay, so that's combustion. Now, what about when you burn things that already have oxygen in them, like alcohols? How do you balance those equations? So for that, let's take an example. Let's say I'm burning um, propanol. So C387OH, that's propanol. What am I doing? How do I know the formula? I know the formula from the general formula. General formula was CnH2n plus one. So I just put three in there. So CnH2n plus one OH. So C3H2 times three, six plus one, seven. OH. So I have propanol. I'm burning it. I'm getting carbon dioxide. Again, I'm burning it in excess oxygen. That's very important. And that's what I get. How do I balance this equation? Now, one way to identify how to balance the equation is to see that already you have an OH in there. So one way, again, this is just one way of doing this. Break the molecule on the left side. Think of it as C386HOH. This is not the only way. This is just one way of thinking about it. And why am I doing this? Because what is HOH? It's one water molecule. So one water molecule is coming from the molecule, from the propanol, and just balance the rest. So I have three carbon, so three carbon dioxide. I have six hydrogen, so that should make three water, right? Because two hydrogens to one water molecule, so six hydrogens to three water molecules. So that's three, and then one more for this, so four. Again, that's not the only way. That is one way of doing this. It's just one way of thinking about it, that one water molecule, the atoms for that can easily be taken out of the propanol. I'm not saying that propanol has water inside. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when it breaks down, the atoms in there can make one water molecule on their own. And that's what I do here. So now I already balanced it. I did not have to think about it too much. So that is three times two, six oxygen, four times one, four oxygen, total six hair, four hair, that is total 10 oxygen atoms. And that tells me that I have five water molecules, uh, five oxygen on the left. So that's another way I can balance this equation. And in the MCQs, they can test us about the ratio of volume or 50 cm cube used. So for example, in this one, they could have said that uh, 1000 cm cube of this is used to produce uh, 
60, 600 cm cube of carbon dioxide or something like that. And that's fine. Okay. So we can easily use the volume ratio and the mole ratio and reconcile them using Avogadro's law. Uh, Hussein, it's general formula. It's not functional formula, it's a general formula. Okay, so this is the general formula. Every homologous series comes with a general formula. So alkane is CNH2N plus two, alkene is CNH2N. So I will share these notes with you at the end of the class so you can review them as well. But functional group is something else. Functional group is something that increases or enhances the properties of chemical compounds. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's suppose uh, I have a student here. Uh, I need a volunteer. Somebody just tell me if I can use your name. All right, so I have Rafi Hassan. Now, if Rafi Hassan goes and becomes a doctor, now that would be Dr. Rafi Hassan. Now, that doctor part is basically giving him a little more uh, respect, a little more credentials, but Rafi Hassan is still Rafi Hassan, that same old Rafi Hassan. It's just the doctor title has added a lot to his credentials and his skills and his abilities, right? Just like that, when you add these things to carbon, to different chemical compounds like OH or CL or BR or I or uh, NH2, all of these things are basically adding more to the properties or skills or abilities of these organic compounds, okay? And we call them functional groups because they enhance the function of those compounds, okay? So the compounds still behave in some fashion to what they usually were, but this is going to add to that. Now, OH is interesting because it can make a homologous series or it can make, it can act as a functional group because if I have both OH and NH2, that that thing won't be an alcohol entirely. It will be, it will have properties of alcohols as well as the properties of NH2. Uh, we have an example of this. Things that have carboxylic acid, that are carboxylic acid, are CWH. And things that have amines in them, NH2, that's amino groups. But you have a class of compounds that has both amino and carboxylic. Okay? So those are amino acids. They have properties of both amino and acids. Okay? So these are functional groups that enhance the properties of these things. Okay? So let's name them. This is hydroxy. This is alcohol if it is the only thing, but in presence of other things, it can be determined as hydroxy. This is chloro, bromo, iodo, and amino or just amine. Okay, so these are some functional groups that add to the properties of things and you should be familiar with them. You should be able to name them. Now, how do you name them? Just like Rafi Hassan became a doctor, Dr. Rafi Hassan the title came before the name. Just like that, for functional groups, the functional group comes before the name. So let me give you an example. I have here ethene. Okay, so this is ethene. And something happens to it. We'll discuss in a bit what could happen. And this now has chlorine in there. So now this thing would be Chloro, ethene. Okay. Uh, let's suppose something else happens and now has bromine as well. So now this thing would be bromo, chloro, ethene. Now, could it be chloro, bromo, ethene? Yeah. But IUPAC, the organization that determines the names of things, says that you should always write function groups in alphabetical order. In OLEMS or IGCSE, you can mess the, or the order, you can flip them, you won't lose marks, but internationally, or it is good chemistry that you write them in alphabetical order. So writing bromochloroethene is better than saying chlorobromoethene. Although, as far as marks are concerned, they're going to be exactly the same. Okay? Yeah. So there you go. So we have functional groups and those functional groups are added to the thing before the name. What if you have more than one functional group? What happens then? You just count them. And for that, you do something that I like to call LCN. 
what is LCM? LCM means locate count name. Okay. Locate the functional group, count how many they are, and then name it. Okay. So for example, in this case, bromine and chlorine are not on the same atom. Carbon, one carbon has bromine and one carbon has chlorine. It's not the same carbon. I could have a different compound which would have chlorine and bromine on the same carbon. And this would still be bromochloroethene. But we already discussed in organic chemistry structure is the most important thing. These have different structure. They're not the same things. So we have to locate, count, name. Locate them. Give the carbon numbers. So I could call this one carbon, this is the second carbon. I could call this one the first carbon, the second carbon. Wait a minute, why didn't I start from the list? Another rule, prefer smaller numbers. If I named this one one, and this one too, then both my functional groups are on the bigger number. I don't want that. We like to have smaller numbers, okay? So, so far we have said that write the function groups before the name in alphabetical order with smaller numbers, okay? So let's name them, locate them. Which carbon is chlorine at? The first carbon in this one. Which carbon is the chlorine at in the top one? Two. Which carbon is the bromine at? One, and this one, one as well. So now the name would be for the top one, one bromo, two chloroethene, and for the second one, one bromo, one chloroethene. Okay. What if, what about count? I didn't count them, right? Because there's only one of them. If there was more than one, for example, I have a third molecule here, and this one just has chlorine. So let's try to first number them. Uh, one, two, why one, two and not two, one? Because smaller numbers work. Okay, locate them. Where's the chlorine? So I know this is ethene. I know this is chloro. Okay. And which carbon are they at? They are on the first carbon. Is that enough? No, you have to identify both of them. Where are both the chlorine atoms? So one, one. This tells me that both of them are on the first carbon. So tell me individually, locate individually. One, one. Then count them. How many chlorine do I have? I have two in total, so die. So if I had three, try. If I had four, tetra. So one, one, dichloro, ethene. Okay, and based on that, I can easily identify the name. Examiner will not ask you to name so things with so many functional groups and all that. But if they give you the name, you should be able to identify which compound it is. Okay, that's important. So I'm going to give you one, a couple of compounds, and I want you to name them. So this one, this one with two chlorine, this one with two chlorine but on the same carbon and this one with a chlorine and a double bond. Go on, take a few minutes, name them.
All right, so the first one, what do you think is the name? First one, really simple. Wow, Rayan is on a roll. Yeah, you've done all of them. Good, good. But remember, here's the rule. Function group comes before the name in alphabetical order with smaller numbers. See if you can fix the numbers for them. Okay, that's the rule. Before the name, alphabetical order, smaller numbers. Let's try this. The first one, as you have rightly said, thank you. It's propane. Second one, uh, the one on the right. I have two chlorine here, right? LCN, locate, count, name. This has three carbons, so it's going to be propane, but it has uh, two chlorines. Where are they? Both on the second carbon. No matter whether you start from the right or from the left. One, two, three, or three, two, one. Eki bata. So I have locate them. Two, two. Count them. I have two of them. So die. What is it? Name it. Chloro. So two, two, dichloropropane. All right. Let's look at this one. This one has chlorine again, but I can number these carbons as one, two, three like that, or one, two, three like that. And I will prefer smaller numbers. So that means my correct order should be this one. So I have propane again, and I have chlorine again, LCN. So name is right, count is right. I have two of them, dichloro and locate. One is on the first carbon, one is on the second carbon. So one, two, dichloropropane and you can clearly see that these are two isomers one is two two dichloropropane and one is one two dichloropropane now let's look at the, this last one this last one it's not a propane it's propene in fact you can also call it prop one e if you're feeling uh, fancy or up to a challenge so prop one e although it's not really required at this stage and then it has chloro, so locate count uh, locate count and name. So locate it, that's on the first carbon, count, there's only one, so I don't need to mention. One chloropropene, or one chloropropene, and there you go. So that's how you name function groups, or that's how the function groups change the name of the compounds. All of that is fine. And we can identify the function groups, and we can make isomers from that. In fact, in the exam, if they ever ask you to make isomers and they have functional groups, just change its position. I gave you butanol. I want you to make isomers for that. Take OH, put it on the second carbon. Okay, so it's really easy. Yes, thank you, that is one chloropropene. Now, let's talk about what, how do we identify isomers? Now, one way of identifying isomers is, so, identifying isomers that's the next section of our lesson here now when you identify isomers one way is to judge them by the definition what was the definition the definition was same function uh, same molecular formula but different structure that's what isomers are so just count the molecular structure just check the molecular structure Okay, so molecular, sorry, molecular formula. Just check that. If they have same molecular formula, two things could be isomers. They could be isomers. The second part of the definition is different structure. Okay. So until both of these statements are correct, you cannot say that they are isomers. All right, so let me give you an example. Uh, examiner says that identify if this compound or this compound this compound this 
these compounds are the isomers or not or which of them are isomers so let's suppose this is a this is b this is c and this is d which of these are isomers molecular formula first do that what is the molecular formula of this one four carbons 10 hydrogens okay four carbons 10 hydrogens four carbons 10 hydrogens four carbons eight hydrogens so clearly not the same molecular formula first statement is false not an isomer okay what about the next one next one uh, let's see in the first one how do you identify that they have different structure for that i have a very simple technique and remember this technique remember those games that we used to play for example uh i had a picture here somewhere hold on let me get So for example, I gave you this puzzle. It's a very common puzzle. And I ask you to connect all the dots without picking a pencil. We can do that, right? We can find a way to connect the dots without picking a pencil. And uh, most people know this already. Uh, there are many different ways. Try to come up with a method. See if you can do that. Join them all without picking a pencil. And of course, you can't repeat, you can't go back and all that. So go on, take a couple of minutes, do it. So you might have tried and uh, one method that I just googled was that you could join them like that. Sorry. So come from outside the box, join these, go a little outside, join these, then this. And there you go. Make a little arrowhead and you have joined all of them. Do the same puzzle with your MCQs, okay? Try to join these without picking a pencil. So let's do it. In A, I start here, one, just count how many carbons you pass. So one, two, three, four. I didn't pick the pencil, I covered them all, four carbons. Now you can bend them, you can take a turn and all that, that's perfectly fine. So one, two, three, four, still four. These are not isomers of each other. A and B are identical to each other. They're exactly the same. Okay, let's try another one. Uh, one, two, three, four. Identical, exactly the same. A, B, C, they're the same thing. Not isomers because they do not have different structure. They do have molecular formula that is same but they do not have different structure. They're not isomers. But let me give an example that is, what if I had this one? If I try to connect the carbons here, one, two, three, I wouldn't be able to join four. It has C4H10, but if I try to join them, let's suppose I try to, I'm like, okay, I can't join them here. Let me try this one, one, two, three. I can't join the fourth one without picking a pencil. Let me try again, one, two, three. Can't, this is an isomer. So A and this compound E, A and E are isomers. They have different structure, okay? So you identify isomers either by knowing 
that the function group has switched places. This one is one chlorine on the first carbon, one on the second. That one is both chlorine on the second. So the function group has switched places. That's an isomer. Or the second kind of isomers that we see in O-levels or IGCSE are these ones, the bent ones. They're not isomers unless you can not join the same chain. For example, I could join four carbon in the same chain, same molecular formula, no, same structure. I couldn't call them isomers. But over there, because I cannot join four carbons, that is isomer. Okay, so that's how you identify isomers. Okay, so that is, we are done with the isomer part. So, so far, we are done with identifying compounds, identifying isomers, naming compounds, naming functional groups, identifying functional groups. Now, let's move on. Uh, let's take a two minute break. Let's come back and we will talk about organic reactions. All right. And after that, we have polymers to go. All right. See you in two minutes.
Welcome back. All right, so let's start with chemical reactions for organic chemistry. Okay, so let's start. So yeah, we I am planning on completing this by six o'clock. So yeah, so we have a little over. Uh, less little less than one hour left all right uh, i will be uh, i've already shared a worksheet with you and i will be sharing the solution for that later on in a video as well so do attempt the worksheet after this class and see if it has actually helped you and i hope it has all right so organic chemistry reactions or just reactions okay all right so the first reaction we already talked about it it's our it's combustion and if you have excess oxygen combustion works okay <laughs> all right uh, then the second thing what if you do not have excess oxygen then you get carbon monoxide and you will get uh, water if you have even less oxygen you will get just carbon okay so carbon and water uh, if you have just hydrogen no carbon that's not an organic compound but you will get water and if you have just carbon that you burn, again, not organic. Carbon itself is not organic, okay? Then if carbon itself burns and produces carbon dioxide only, that's not organic. But any compound of carbon that's not carbon dioxide, that's not carbon monoxide, we use them or any fuel based on carbon, that is organic reaction. So we have seen combustion reaction. The next question, the next reaction that we're going to see is substitution. Now, here's what I want you to do. Take a notebook, uh, the notebook that you're working on, and keep one page and just write alkane on that, okay? So, I'll come back to this, but on your notebook, just write alkane right in the middle of the page or somewhere at the top, just write alkane and leave that page empty for now. We will build on that, okay? We are going to build a map. All right, so substitution, how does that work? So back to your other page. So substitution is, as the name suggests, you substitute, you replace, okay? So replacing one, it could be atom, it could be functional group, it could be any part of the molecule, which we usually call the species. Doesn't have to be just one atom, it could be the whole NH2, it could be the whole OH that I replace. Okay, a group of atom uh, that we replace and with another one at a time. That's very important. One at a time. For example, if I'm replacing hydrogen with chlorine, I'll do it one at a time. One hydrogen replaced with one chlorine. Then the second hydrogen replaced with second chlorine. If I do that, that's substitution. Okay, so I could do that with halogens and halogens can displace other halogens or they can displace hydrogen and uh, you need ultraviolet light for that. So in our syllabus, we usually talk about the reaction of chlorine. So what happens is that, for example, if I had uh, this thing here and I react it with chlorine. Okay. Now, how many hydrogens do I have? I have six different hydrogens, which means I can replace six different hydrogens with six different chlorine atoms. Because this is substitution, I cannot replace all of them at once. One at a time, that's very important. Okay, so let's do it. Let's displace them, let's substitute them. Let's take one hydrogen from anywhere and put it in place of chlorine. So if I take a hydrogen, put it with chlorine, I get this. And then, so I'm what I'm doing right now is I'm taking this hydrogen and this chlorine and switching them. That's one at a time, that is substitution. So if I do that, I will end up with uh, all five hydrogens are there, but now I have chlorine here. Okay, one at a time. But do you notice that I've also made HCl and this reaction could not occur without ultraviolet light. This cannot occur in the dark because I need chlorine-chlorine bond to break and chlorine-chlorine bond can easily break because ultraviolet light has enough energy to break that bond. It cannot break the bond between carbon and hydrogen. It cannot break the bond between carbon and carbon. Why? Because the bond energy is higher than the ultraviolet light has the energy. 
the bond is stronger than ultraviolet light can provide the energy to break. But chlorine chlorine bond is weak. It can break it, it can displace it. And now this happens. We have seen this before. There was another reaction in acid basis salts where we saw a similar thing, one thing displacing the other thing. We called that displacement. But this one we are not calling displacement. We're calling substitution. So that's a key difference that we use that some for organic compounds we say substitution and for others we say displacement but technically they're the same thing you're just changing one with another okay so that's there i could continue this process i could take this same molecule give it more chlorine and ultraviolet light and what this will do is replace another hydrogen with another chlorine but i cannot displace two at a time I will displace one at a time, we will substitute one at a time. And that is important to remember that whenever you do substitution, one atom or one species at a time. So I could maybe take this one. If I do this one, then I'm going to get Cl here, Cl there and HCl. This chlorine was already there. This chlorine just came in. Okay. Uh, Musa, this applies to all halogens except fluorine. Okay. But uh, for fluorine, we don't need to go into the detail in all levels. So bromine, iodine, chlorine, even acetine would do the same. Okay. Yeah, that's one way I could do it. But another way I could do it is that in place, instead of replacing that hydrogen, I could displace this hydrogen, the hydrogen with the carbon that's already there. And in this case, I will get both chlorines on the same carbon. And that's fine. In fact, when this reaction actually occurs, we get all these different isomers, different atoms replaced. Kabhi wo dono carbons ko individually kar deta hai, kabhi wo eki carbon pe alayda alayda kar deta hai. So it depends. So we will get these isomers. And then what do we do? How do we separate them? Fractional distillation. Because these are different compounds, different boiling points, you can separate them through fractional distillation. So you do get, in substitution, you do get isomers, but you, dis, you separate them by fractional distillation. So chapter two comes to mind. Uh, a few of these things that you're supposed to remember, you need to know that methane, when this undergoes repeated substitution, once one hydrogen is displaced, then the second is displaced, then the third is displaced, then the fourth is displaced. This process creates two industrially important compounds. One is dry cleaning agent. So you keep on doing the substitution, you will create dry cleaning agents. Or you keep on doing the substitution reaction with the methane or with other things, you will create the compounds that are used as anesthesia. So there's this gas halothane. Halothane is when you displace hydrogen with fluorine and uh, you use that in the compound. So that is used uh, as an anesthesia, okay? So there are other gases as well. And uh, in halothane, you have all the hydrogens displaced with, I think all the hydrogens, if I'm not wrong, chlorine, fluorine, bromine. We displace one, well, sometimes we displace it with fluorine, sometimes we displace it with bromine, some with chlorine. But the substitution reaction is there. You're just substituting them. And you need ultraviolet light for halogens to react. Uh, can substitution occur without halogens? Of course, substitution does occur without halogens. In fact, uh, later on in A-levels, you will study when ions can displace other ions and positive ions can displace positive ions, negative ions can substitute negative ions in organic compounds. Ions do replace each other, substitute each other. But in O-levels or IGCSE, we just talk about halogens displacing hydrogen. So that's substitution reaction, okay? So, yeah. Next we have, now the names will obviously vary. If you add one chlorine, you displace one hydrogen, it becomes monochloromethane. If it has two, dichloromethane, three, trichloromethane, four, tetrachloromethane. And you can do the same thing with alkenes as well. For example, uh, this alkene is used to make Teflon, which is a polymer. And how do you think we came up with this? We start with alkene that has hydrogens all there, ethene. We substitute one hydrogen with one fluorine, then another with another fluorine, then another with another fluorine. And we keep on repeating the process until all of them have been substituted. 
This thing is called tetrafluoroethene or used to make Teflon. Similarly, there is another one. I take this thing, I do substitution on just one side and I make chlorine. That is uh, vinyl chloride, chloroethene used to make PVC that we use to make pipes. Okay, so you can convert same substance into different uh, compounds by using substitution reaction. And that's a very important application of this. So we can make dry cleaning agents from them. We can make anesthesia from them. And of course, we can make these different alkenes from them. All right, so that is substitution. Let's move on. So in substitution, just remember one atom at a time or one in O levels, it's just one atom, but later on you will see one species at a time. The second reaction that we need to know about is addition. So how is addition different from substitution? Remember, in substitution, you're displacing one atom or species at a time. You're just substituting it. In addition, you are adding, as the name suggests. So what you're doing is two things. You first break the double bond. So that's important, sorry. So break the double bond. In fact, we just break the second one and the double bond, not both of them. Okay. And then you add to both carbons. And that is the primary difference in substitution and addition. You're adding to both carbons. Let me give an example. This is something with a double bond. This is something with just a single bond. I cannot do addition on the second compound because it doesn't have double bond. For addition, I need to break the double bond. Okay, that's one. If I react this with chlorine, and if I react this with chlorine, what will happen? Both of them can react with chlorine. But in one of them, I can only do substitution. In the other, I can do substitution as well as addition. Okay. Yeah. Let's try to do substitution first. Let's say I take this hydrogen, replace it with chlorine. I get this thing, but this hydrogen is just substituted and I get HCl. Right. Let's try substitution on the other one. Let's say I just substitute this hydrogen. So now I'm going to get the same thing, but chlorine here and HCl here. Substitution, straightforward. I need ultraviolet light. This is substitution. None of it is addition. This is substitution, should be here somewhere. All right, so let me just delete that. Now, what if I wanted to do addition? I will need to first break the double bond. So I need a double bond, of course. Break the double bond. Okay, I'm adding chlorine again, but this time I'm not giving ultraviolet light. Uh, I break the double bond. Okay, both the double bond is broken. The double bond is broken, and now add chlorine on both carbons. That's addition. That's the primary difference in addition and substitution. That at the same time you are adding to two carbons. Over there you are adding to one carbon at a time. So one chlorine here, one chlorine here. There you go. That's addition. Let's try one more thing. But these carbons, by the way, have to be adjacent. Why? Because they are the ones that had double bond, right? So you're breaking them, the, the double bond there. Let's try with a larger molecule. Let's suppose I have four carbons like that. Okay. And now I try to do, let's say I add uh, bromine. Okay. No problem. The method is break the double bond, add it to both. Okay, so here's what happens. Again, I don't need ultraviolet light because ultraviolet light will do substitution. I don't need that. I, I could do this in the dark. Okay, so I can't do addition on this carbon. It doesn't have double bond. I need to first break the double bond. So I break the double bond. I draw this thing without the double bond. Fair enough. Now add it to both carbons. So this gets a bromine. This gets a bromine. There you go. That's addition, okay? Now, it's fairly simple, but this has many, many different applications. In fact, this is the reason that alkenes are so useful in industry.
because they can do many different things. One of these is addition. You can add virtually unlimited number of things to them and make new compounds all the time. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to ask you to work with this compound. Okay, so I have this compound. I want you to add hydrogen to it, then chlorine to it, then bromine to it, then HCl to it, okay? And then FCl to it. Go on, do it. Same thing, add this thing. Go on, complete this equation. What's happening? Yep. Yes, Ryan, all reactions need activation energy. So all reactions need energy to start. Go on, complete these equations. I think you can see them all. Uh, one more, add water. How could I forget that? Add water to it. Once you're done, try to name these things. All right, so I believe we should be able to do them all. Okay, yes. Yeah, we have somebody who has already done it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so here's how we do it. Again, re remember the method. Break the double bonds and then add to each carbon, that's it. So over here, let me break the double bond. If I break the double bond, in all of them, I will get this thing. So let me make copies of that one two, three, four, and five. Okay, so let's add them. So in this first one, I am going to add hydrogen. So one is added to the first carbon, one is added to the second carbon, there you go. This thing is hydrocarbon. This is propene, okay? That was converted to propane because you just added hydrogen and because you added hydrogen you can call this reaction addition of hydrogen or hydrogen addition or hydrogenation right so simple this is hydrogenation you're adding hydrogen to an alkene to an unsaturated compound this thing is not saturated because it has double bond and you're getting a saturated compounds. Where do we use it in industry? We use it to convert vegetable oil. Vegetable oil has polyunsaturated compound. It's basically many, many double bonds. So I'll just write that word there. Polyunsaturated. Poly means many, unsaturated means double bonds. Polyunsaturated compound. That's vegetable oil. 
okay and we convert it to vegetable oil we add hydrogen and we are able to convert it to margarine that's an industrial process we use nickel as a catalyst we use 300 degrees cell we use high temperature you don't need to mention the uh, temperature exactly so that's how you make margarine okay let's look at the second one in the second reaction you're adding chlorine okay so this gets a chlorine this gets a chlorine there you go and yes uh, Ryan's uh, Ryan has correctly named it this is one two dichloropropane not propane propane okay let's look at the third one uh, this is uh, again one bromine here one bromine here now here's the thing bromine is soluble in water to some extent and it has a very dark orange red brown kind of color so which means that before the reaction you will see a red brown color here or an orange color here okay but after the reaction there's no more bromine bromine has been added to the molecule that molecule is now an organic compound which is one two dibromopropane it's no longer bromine which means there is no longer any orange color coming in. So we say that bromine solution has been decolorized. In fact, if you have water in there, that water can also be added at the same time as bromine and make alcohols or bromoalcohols and all that. No need to get into that. But just remember that bromine, as long as it adds to the thing, now it's no longer going to show that orange color, which means the thing decolorizes. And what do we use it for? We call it the test for unsaturation. If you want to know that an unknown compound, does it have a double bond or not? Just pass it through a small quantity of it through bromine water. Initially, before the reaction, it will be orange. But after the reaction, it won't be orange anymore, which will show that this thing is reacted. It had a double bond that has now been changed. All right. So this is called a test for unsaturation. This tells us if something has a double bond, bromine will add and convert to uh, go colorless. It will go orange to colorless or red brown to colorless. But if you do not have a double bond, then bromine can't react unless there is ultraviolet light present. So bromine can't react and bromine will not do decolorization. Okay, that's that. We could do, we could add HCl again, same thing. One gets hydrogen, one gets chlorine. We get chloropropane. In the next one, we are adding uh, fluorine. Or oh, first one gets, one gets fluorine, one gets chlorine. Or it could be the other way around. One gets chlorine and then the other one gets fluorine. Now this compound is part of a large group of compounds called chlorofluorocarbons. And chlorofluorocarbons are primarily responsible for depletion of ozone. They are extremely useful. Otherwise, they are very unreactive at room temperature and uh, that makes them very useful. We, use, we used to use them for anesthetics. We used to use them. Uh, I gave you the example of halothane. That's a chlorofluorocarbon. No, bromofluorocarbon. Uh, then uh, we use them. We used to use them as refrigerant gases uh, in aerosol sprays because they for many different reasons one of them them being unreactive but then at in the upper atmosphere they start to react with ozone and obviously there is ultraviolet light present and what does ultraviolet light do to chlorine breaks it bond right that's what ultraviolet does and chlorine is the primary culprit there remember this thing write it down somewhere that it is chlorine primarily that is responsible for depletion of ozone from CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Okay, it's not fluorine, it's chlorine. So when upper in the upper atmosphere, chlorine breaks down, reacts with the ozone, makes oxygen. So ozone is not able to safeguard uh, the environment anymore. And lastly, we have water and this water won't react with it right away at room temperature. So we need to give it high temperature. We could give it 300 degrees Celsius. We could give it an acid catalyst. IGCSE people are supposed to know that this is phosphoric catalyst, phosphoric acid, but O levels people don't need to remember that. And when you do this and uh, what happens, and there is 60 atmospheric pressure as well. Again, IGCSE people need to remember this, not O level peoples. And this will add hydrogen on one and OH on the other. Now again, you will get isomers. 
you could get hydrogen here and OH here. And whenever you're writing, make sure you write the bond between O and H. Many students just write OH together. That's not right. You could get that or you could get OH here and H there. These are isomers. There is a rule that you study later on, Markovnikov's rule that tells me which one will form more and which one will form less. But we don't need to go into that for now. Just remember that you will get isomers. And how do you separate isomers? Fractional distillation. Okay. These are all addition reactions. And we have suddenly made a totally new kind of homologous series, if you remember. What have we done? We have made alcohols. So, so far, what have we seen? We have seen that alkanes are really good for substitution or fuel because they burn. Uh, then we saw that addition is something that alkenes are good at. And you can add so many things and make so many new things. No wonder alkenes are used as feedstock. Feedstock means used to make different chemicals. And now we have alcohols. Alcohols have, uh, so there's two ways in which alcohols are made. One we just saw, addition, uh, catalytic addition of steam. And you take an alkene, an unsaturated compound, you add alcohol to that it forms, uh, you add water to that, steam to that, it forms alcohol. There's another method, which is fermentation. And that fermentation, in fact, let's just keep it for now. We'll come back to it. Let's look at what alcohols can do. Alcohols, when they react, they have this OH thing, right? So they can react as acids, really. They can also react as alkalis, rarely. And those properties, we don't need to get into that for now. What one property that we need to know about alcohols, they can do condensation. What's condensation? I just talked about it right in the beginning of the lesson. Condensation is when you remove one thing from one part and one from the other part. Okay, you take a small molecule, you remove one small portion of that, you take another molecule, you remove one small portion of that and then join them. That's condensation. I'll give you an example of that. Alcohols can also do one other thing which is called oxidation. So alcohols can do oxidation. Now what does oxidation do? Here's the thing. So we have seen that in substitution, you replaced one atom at a time or one species at a time. In addition, you broke the double bond, then you add it to each carbon. What do you do in oxygen? Oxidation. In oxidation, you have to remember that it is the oxygen that causes oxidation. You can't just do oxidation without it, especially in O-levels or IGCSE. There are ways that we study later on in A-levels, but not right now. We don't get into that. So here's what you do. Remove two hydrogens. from the carbon with oxygen. Pay attention. You look at the carbon with oxygen. Identify that. Don't you? Remove two hydrogens. Now, technically, both hydrogens don't come from that carbon. But we don't need to go into that. Remove two hydrogens. First, identify the carbon with oxygen. Then, remove two hydrogens from there and replace with one oxygen. That's oxidation. Let me recap. Again, this is very simplified just for O-levels and IGCSE. In A-levels, just forget it, okay? You look at, I'll take the example of ethanol. So I have ethanol here. First thing, identify the carbon with oxygen. Okay, I found it. Remove the two hydrogens. So I removed the two hydrogens. Replace with one oxygen. So oxygen needs two bonds, right? So two bonds. I just oxidized it. But you can't just oxidize on your own. You need an oxidizing agent. Yes, Ryan, you're right. We need an oxidizing agent. So KMnO4 is an excellent oxidizing agent. So we will need, in presence, of oxidizing agent. So KMnO4 is a good one. It's a strong oxidizing agent. 
there are many others but this is the one in our syllabus you need to know that when this reacts it goes purple to colorless and this is the reaction that's happening again let's take another example i have methanol here look at the carbon with oxygen or propanol let's say so i have propanol three carbons there okay so look at the carbon with oxygen okay found it remove the two hydrogens done add an oxygen done what if I had it in um, different forms? Like if I had multiple OH groups, so I have this thing. Okay. Again, method is the same. Find the carbon with oxygen. Okay, done. This one also has oxygen. So remove the two hydrogen, done. And add the oxygen. So oxygen, oxygen. There you go. This is called dicarboxylic acid. Which one? Prop. 1,3-dicarboxylic acid, but we don't need to get into that. Okay. All right. So basically what we're doing is we are displacing the two hydrogens and through some other method by, but in the structure, we're just taking the root hydrogen away and adding an oxygen. Again, this is a very simplified version of what actually happens. This is not entirely the pathway through which this occurs, but this is good for understanding and for the exam okay so what does it make it makes alcohols convert to carboxylic acids right so let's remember i asked you to write alkane on a page let's go back to that where was that let's see yeah this one so if you see we have seen that alkanes can be converted alkenes by cracking right we have already seen that cracking does that and we saw in this reaction of addition that you could add hydrogen and make alkane so alkenes go back to alkanes through addition of hydrogen which is hydrogenation this is the method by which you make margarine. We also saw that you can convert alkenes to alcohols by adding steam. Catalytic addition of steam. You are 60 atmospheric pressure, 300 degrees Celsius, phosphoric acid as a catalyst. And you make alcohols. And what do you do to remove that? Just add a dehydrating agent and it will convert back so you take a dehydrating agent it could be an aluminum oxide but you don't need to get into that and you're making alcohol again and now we just saw that you can convert alcohol to carboxylic acid by oxidation and that means I could convert carboxylic acid to alcohol by reduction. And that's true. I could take a reducing agent and convert it back. That's true. We have a neat map coming around. Okay, we'll come back to this. Note it down somewhere on the same, pa same page. Sorry. done okay so we are almost at the last reaction now and this reaction is called condensation now condensation 
Uh, do we need to know the detailed equation, catalyst and conditions for each of these? Uh, I will share a, a, like a cheat sheet with you. Sorry. I'll share a cheat sheet with you, which will have all the things that you need to memorize. Okay. And uh, you can just read through that. Those are the only things you're supposed to memorize. This is all for understanding. I will separately give you a sheet for that. Okay, condensation, what's the reaction about? Again, condensation is you remove small parts of each molecule. Okay, you take any two molecules, you remove small parts of each molecule if you can, and then you join the rest. The mantra for this, so what's the method? You remove small molecules and join the rest together. Now what's that small molecule? That small molecule could be NH2 from one side and H from the other side to make ammonia. That small molecule could be H from one side and OH from the other side to make water. That's a small molecule that you're able to make by removing them. Okay, so you need two molecules. So take two molecules, at least obviously, and you remove H from one, OH from the other, join them together, that's condensation. You remove NH2 from one, H from the other, join them together, condensation. Now in our syllabus, we don't get uh, ammonia or the reaction that produce ammonia or even HCl, we don't get that. You could do HCl, you could take Cl from one, H from the other, join them together and you have condensation. As long as you're able to take away smaller parts and join the rest together, that's condensation. In our syllabus, we just stick with H2O, but we could have HCl, ammonia, H2O. All right, so let's take an example. I have a carboxylic acid. So I have a carboxylic acid, okay, and I have an alcohol. I see them and I'm like, wait a minute, I could remove H from the uh, one of them, OH from the other one, and that will make water, right? And join the rest. Now here's a very easy way of understanding this. Call it RCJ. Remove, copy, join. Let me demonstrate. What does it mean? First of all, because you want to do condensation, remove a small portion. So for example, on this one, I could remove hydrogen. On this one, I remove OH. Done. Copy. Copy the remaining part. So for this one, I can copy this. Okay. So I copied this and uh, I copied that. Okay. And join them. Remove, copy, join. And there you go. That's condensation. Now, what kind of compound is it? We have already identified this. Do you see that this has ester linkage in it? So this is an ester. And we know how to name them, right? Esters, they end their name with O-A-T-E. Why? Do you remember nitrates, carbonates, phosphates? They all have A-T-E at the end of the name. This is organic salt. Those were salts, right? This is also organic salt. So O is just there to tell me organic salt. Just like, uh, remember that we had hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, phosphoric acid, they all had IC at the end of the name. And then we got ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, they are organic acids. So OIC at the end of the name. So there's a pattern there. And that's what I'm going to get here. I'm going to get OATE as the end of the name. And I'll just look at what's the number of carbons in there. So I have two carbons in there. So ethanoate. Ethanoate. And this is my branch. And in the branch, I have one carbon, so methyl. 
methylethanoid how do you name esters that's a question that many students unfortunately do not understand completely you just take the carbon with oxygens the one with oxygens and identify how many carbons there are let's do a couple of examples let's do this so let's suppose i have uh, this thing okay now what do i have here i have this carbon with oxygens and i have three in a long chain so this one is prop because three propa no eight because this is ester and this one is a branch how do you name branches methyl ethyl propyl butyl that's how branches are so this one is ethyl and yes ryan you make a very good point remember the branch always comes from alcohol so this is from the alcohol this is from the acid and that's a very easy way of understanding this okay so that's how you name the esters now here's the thing if i ask you i want to make methyl ethanoate and ethyl methanoate what should i use to make them so all you got to know is that the branch comes from alcohol so this is meth so i need methanol this is eth i need ethanol so this is from ethanol this is from methanol and what about this one this comes from the acid so i will react it with ethanoic acid and this comes from the acid methanoic acid and there you go that's how you name esters okay now that i know how to name esters can i do the same condensation process and what is condensation process take any two molecules remove a small portion from one small portion from the other join the rest together okay can i do that with bigger molecules or molecules that have it on both sides of course i can let's try that i have this thing always on both sides i have this thing acid part on both sides what's my method remove copy join remove h from both sides sure oh from both sides done copy copy the rest so i'm copying this copying that join done now this is called a repeat unit copy this one again join that again and there you go that is a condensation polymer and what linkage does it have you can clearly see that the linkage is c double o this is an ester polyester terylene and n tells me that n tells me that there's so many of them and i'm getting water water because i removed h and oh and why two because i'm removing from both sides condensation condensation principle at work okay let's try uh one more time i have ethanol and i react it with um in fact let's not have ethanol let's say i have carboxylic acid and i react it with um diamine okay what happens these are hydrogens remember remove copy join uh let's remove hydrogen and oh so on one side i'll remove hydrogen so i'll remove hydrogen here hydrogen here oh here oh here okay so i'm because i'm removing two hydrogen two oh i'm getting two water and of course if it is n molecules i'll get two n water and then remove removed copy i'll copy this part whatever is left i'll copy that okay this part i'll copy that 
okay copied join so i'll just join this thing with that thing and there you go i made a repeat unit copy it again and there you go i have made a polymer what polymer condensation polymer how do i know it's condensation polymer it has linkage in them what linkage amide linkage okay is it amide or is it peptide let's see c n n c c n n c so this is flipping if it flips it is amide if it doesn't flip it is peptide so this one is amide linkage so this could be nylon or something with the same structure of the linkage and these are condensation polymers can i do the same remove copy join thing on alkenes of course i can let's say i take alkenes so uh polyethene let's try to make that this one is ethene again remember remove copy join that's a method but here you can't remove a small portion of the molecule what do you remove remove the double bond so remove the double bond done copy the thing okay copy the thing join it sure join it and you have made a polymer which polymer this was ethene so this is polyethene and what does it make plastic bags that's what we used to make from this okay let's try another one are you following this any question feel free to ask let's try this one i do substitution on this get chlorine here which makes it chloro ethene which we will also call vinyl chloride rcj remove copy join remove the double bond everything else remains the same just remove the double bond copy copy the thing all right done join joined it there you go this one is polychloroethene or polyvinyl chloride pvc used to make pipes water pipes gas pipes all that one more let's say i take ethene again and i do substitution on it multiple times and i get fluorine on all of them this one is tetra because four fluoro because fluorine ethene so ethene has four fluorine in there and then i do the same thing rcj so removed everything else remains the same just remove them all copy copied the thing okay and join it removed copy join this one is called teflon and it's used to make non stick pans it's a black coating on the non stick pans that you have and these are the three polymers that you're supposed to know about for o levels and igcse both of them okay so these are the three condensation uh, addition polymers that you need to know about now you will notice that in all of them and harun this is similar to your question in all of them once you removed the double bond rcj once you remove the double bond you don't have any double bond anymore in fact these are all single bonds the uh, these are saturated but the polymer is still called with the name of its monomer because it makes it easy to remember what the monomer was or what we made it from so this is a polymer but we'll remember it as polychloroethene or polytetrafluoroethene or polyethene even though it has no double bond it's telling me that it is ethene molecules joined with each other so that's why the name is not polyethene it's polyethene okay and uh, do you have seen that in addition polymers all you do to the name is you add poly there but in condensation polymers you remember them from the linkage and that's the primary difference and how do you know their polymers we have already talked about it they have this continuity there they are continuing like that 
Another difference, these addition polymers don't have any byproduct. These condensation polymers always give us a small molecule. That small molecule could be HCl, H2O or ammonia. And that is polymers. All right. So now we know what this thing is about. So let's go back to that map that we were making. So we have already talked about this whole portion. Now let's see if I can add something to that. Sure I can. Let me see. If I add alkene to alkene, I do poly polymerization. I'm taking an alkene like ethene, adding it to itself. Okay. And similarly, if I took a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, I was able to make esters from that. And again, I was able to remove that by condensation. So this process is condensation. And that is your organic chemistry. That's it. It was a pleasure having a class with you. And uh, I will share the worksheet. I, I, I think I've already shared the worksheet and I would like you to solve it and try to come up with different answers. You can always send it to me. Uh, feel free to share the worksheet or the uh, video with your friends. I would highly recommend that you do it. Uh, more worksheets like this and everything is available on ahmedbukhari.com. And for more lessons, make sure that you subscribe and uh, do share with your friends, invite them to these. Thank you so much. Any questions? All right then, I'll see you in the next class. Uh, I am looking for ideas of how we can have a crash course. I'm just thinking about it. It's not finalized, but I'm thinking of having a crash course in Ramzan. And from Monday onwards, we are doing a past paper session. Feel free to sign up, feel free to join. We will solve many, many years of papers. I don't want to stick to just five years. I will strive to do as many papers as we can. And I will be taking four mock exams. So make sure that you sign up and I'm sure it will be really helpful for your preparation. Take care. Allah Hafiz.